Well, I think it depends to some degree on what you mean by stronger. So physical strength is one element. And like if you look at mythological heroes, imagine that the stories of heroes are fragmented elements of, a, of the archetype. And so one kind of archetypal hero, obviously, is someone who's physically strong. You know, you see that there's a great movie that you could watch about this. It's called Hitman Heart. It's one of the best documentaries I've ever seen, and it's about this guy named Bret Hart. And Bret Hart was, for a while, the most famous Canadian on the planet. And he was a worldwide wrestling foundation, I think. What did they call that? WWF? Yeah. He was their, like, lead good guy. And so he, and wrestling, I loved the documentary, because when I was a little kid, like four or five, I used to watch his father, whose name was Stu Hart, who ran this channel, this wrestling confederation in Alberta. And Stu Hart had, I think, eight boys, and he trained all of them to be pro wrestlers. And part of the movie is extraordinarily funny, because Stu Hart is in it, and he's really old. He's like 85, and he's just barely... Can you imagine? He was like a pro wrestler for 40 years. Like, every joint is broken. And he's still big, but he's just barely moving. And this, this, this kid and another kid come over, and um, Stu is telling the story about how he used to take his boys into the basement and toughen them up. And I think Brett called that the journey to pain or something like that. His father would take all these kids down there and wrestle with them and push them right to the edge of their pain tolerance constantly. And so, and anyways, they grew up tough. There's no doubt about that. And uh, all his daughters married pro wrestlers too. And I think he had seven daughters. So he's quite the character. Anyways, these two kids, they're like, they're late adolescents, early adulthood come over. And one of them's pretty damn cocky. And he's listening to Stu. And he says something smart like, well, you know, you were pretty, you were pretty tough with the old days, hey? And Stu looks at him and says, well, wh why don't you come down to the basement with me? And, and he says... Well, look, I don't want to hurt you, old man. And so, so the filmmakers follow them into the basement, eh? And, and like, they're, they're kind of standing there, and the old guy grabs him in a headlock and takes him like, he's like a snake, eh? He's got him in a headlock, like, so fast, and the, the kid doesn't know what to do. And then, so Stu, like, who knows how to put a headlock on someone, he's, like, flexing his, his, uh, his, uh, if his forearm, yeah, which is like still not so bad a forearm. And he's got this guy's face is just, he's just, he's like he's stepped in a bear trap. Plus, he's absolutely shocked that this old guy got him. And so he's kind of gasping. And Stu says something like, you watch, if I flex this muscle just right, you can see this vein on his forehead start to <laughs> pop out. It's extraordinarily funny. Anyways, Bret Hart um, plays out the good guy archetype. And, and Bret's, like he's a solid guy, but... He's, I would say he's not particularly sophisticated, and I'm not, not being cruel about that. I mean, he had a great career, and he's tough as a boot, and so good for him. But he plays out this, um, this good guy archetype, and he gets tangled up in it. And now, I don't remember your damn question, but I am trying to answer it. <laughs> Let, tell me the question again. So I was wondering how, in reality, you go from who's strongest and who's weakest to what's good and what isn't. Oh, yes, yes, okay, exactly. Well, so one of the things I really liked about this movie was it showed me why people watched wrestling. And I couldn't, I couldn't because certainly they're not appealing, and I'm, I'm not being... There are different strata of conception of abstraction that any entertainment process has to appeal to. And, you know, most people don't go to movies. And that's actually because, it really is because movies operate at a level of sophistication that are too high, that is too high for many people. Just like novels. I mean, hardly anyone reads, you know, and if, if you, about 15% of the population, might be 20%, cannot read well enough to follow in written instructions. And so, and, and, and people who are, maybe it's 15% of the population or 10% have never finished a book. Never. And so, and it is that high. But, but you still, there's still, the archetype still needs to manifest itself at different levels, and so it manifests itself in wrestling. But even there, where it is physical force, it's not just physical force. Like, it's a drama between good and evil. And you can see this so clearly in, in, in the Bret Hart documentary, because he's the good guy. And, you know, the bad guys are really over-the-top bad. It's a real drama. It's like, it's good versus evil in the ring every time. And hopefully good wins, but good often gets, you know, maybe the bad wrestler brings two of his friends in and they bring in chairs and they bash the hell out of the good guy. And the whole audience is just outraged by this. And, and the documentary does a lovely job of showing that. But 
So even at the level of physical combat, let's say, you can't reduce what's good to what's strong. It's just one element of it. Better to be strong than to be weak. And so you can have a strong hero because it's better to be strong than to be weak. But it's better to be strong and kind than to be strong. And it's better to be strong and kind and wise than to be strong and kind. And so, and that's true not only for human beings, but it's even true, let's say, at the wolf or the chimpanzee level. Because one of the things you see with the chimp dominance hierarchy is if, and I think I mentioned this before, is if the leader, the dominant male, is really good at fostering social relations and being reciprocal in acts like grooming and also paying attention to the females and their offspring, his dynasty will be much more stable. And so strong might be good for one battle, it might be good for two battles, but for 50 battles, it's not optimized. Especially because no, long, no matter how strong you are, someone can take you out. So, so what happens is, the idea of what's ideal becomes increasingly complex across time, multifaceted, right? And so, strength, wisdom, intelligence, vision, all these things are amalgamated into a single being. And we'll talk a lot about that, because I want to show you how that happened in Mesopotamia, because that's one of the first places where we have documentation about how that ideal emerged. They have a god called Marduk, and Marduk had 50 names. And as far as I can tell, the reason for that was that Marduk was an amalgam of the tribal deities of at least 50 tribes. And, and when, the, when the tribes were brought together and civilized, each of their gods who were ideals had to be amalgamated into something that was a single, a single dramatized representation of value, or there was no way that all those people could have lived together, right? Their different value structures would have fragmented them and they would have stayed in a state of war. And so the question is, it's the question you're asking. If it's not strength, then what is it? Well, strength is an element, but the Egyptians figured out that it was vision. It was actually the capacity to pay attention. That was paramount. And the, the Mesopotamians had that figured out more or less too, because their god Marduk had eyes all the way around his head. He could see everywhere. So seeing was a critical element of what should be on top. And the other thing for the Mesopotamians was the ability to speak. So by the time of Mesopotamia, people had already dramatized the idea that, that cardinal human attributes are vision and the ability to speak. So, and that be the ability to speak the truth too, not just speak. So.